Hi, welcome to Peak Moment. I'm Janaea Donaldson. Peak Moment is about community responses for a changing energy future, and today I'm in Vancouver, BC. We're going to be talking about food and agriculture and urban communities. I'm with Spring Gillard. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me here. Who herself is into urban agriculture and composting. That's right. And let's go to the Vancouver Food Policy Council. What is this? How did it get started? What are they about? Okay. Well, we are a volunteer advisory board, and we have 20 members. They come from all different sectors in the food system. So there's people from food retail, there's people like me from composting, waste management, urban agriculture, uh, the health sector. Mm -hmm. So a really broad representation. And then we also have some liaison members, so a member from the city council, the school board, the park board. Mm -hmm. So it goes into the government and the school. That's right. right. And then we actually come under the jurisdiction of the social planning department in the city. So we work very closely with their staff, primarily the food policy coordinator. So there's a, okay, so I, I'm, there's a governmental person who's a food coordinator. Yes. Okay. Food policy Do coordinator. Do something, rathers. She works with us and she interfaces with the community as okay, well. Okay, okay. Yes. So why did you form and how long ago? <clears throat> well, this has been a long process. I mean, there was a real passion for food issues in the city. There were a lot of groups already working and mm -hmm. delivering food-related programs uh, in the city. So there was a long lead up to it um, and a lot of lobbying that went on. But ultimately, in July of 2003, the city of Vancouver approved a motion that set about to develop and support a just and sustainable food system for the city of Vancouver. A just and sustainable food system. Now that's, yes. that's not a normal policy that I hear of in cities. It's, it's not normal. And there's only three food policy councils in Canada, and uh, we're the third. And there are food policy councils scattered throughout the US, mm -hmm. but they aren't the norm. So what happened at that point is they formed a food uh, task force, okay. and they went about and did some you know, consensus kind of things. But that task force what was made up of city councillors, again, school board, park board, okay. um, regional government, and about 70 different community groups. 70? Yeah. That is a big size task force. So <laughs> huge representation from the community and a lot of input. And what they came up with was a food action plan, okay. uh, which was approved in December of that same year, 2003, by City Council. And one of the recommendations in the plan was to create a food policy council. And presto, we wow. were, we were born. We okay. Yes, so that's how it evolved. So tell me what kinds of, I could imagine <clears throat> with 70 or more people with input and hopefully buy-in, what are the kinds of themes or issues or concerns or you know goals, whatever, that that council that you're all aiming to work with? Well, it it took about a year to come up with you know sort of who we are and how we're going to work and function and you know we're still kind of jiggling with that a little bit. But our main areas of work have been um, we wanted to look at access to groceries. What were the barriers and, and gaps around people being able to access food? We wanted to look at waste management issues. Um, mm. What, mm. again, what are the barriers or even opportunities around recovering food, reusing, recycling okay. food? Okay. Um, the third was to create a food charter. And the fourth was to um, create an institutional food purchasing policy. That okay, all sounds really big and formal, but we can break those let's down go back. a little. Let's, let's look at how those sort yeah. of look on the ground or examples of each of exactly. those. Start at the top. Okay, well, what did I start with? Was it mm -hmm. access? Yeah, access? Access, to, access okay. to food. That was my subcommittee, so hopefully I can, um, I can speak to that one. Well, we started to do some research into it, and um, but lo and behold, I mean, we, we got kind of into it and then we discovered this other group of researchers who were actually doing a study right at that moment. It was called the Food Assessment uh, Report, the FORC Report we called it. 
Uh, fork. So, fork. I like that. That's very so, good. <laughs> a local group of food researchers, and they were taking a look at the state of the food system right as it was. And again, what the gaps were, um, what, was, what was keeping people from, from getting to food. And they came up with a number of recommendations. So we basically took that fork report and have used it in, in that area, and it that's become like, kind of a blueprint they for gave, us. They did some work for you. Terrific. So I can give you some examples of the, yeah. of the, um, of the recommendations. Uh, publicizing the importance of buying local. So wherever we are, we try and, and impress yes. that upon people, yes. that yes. buying local uh, is a really good way to go. It supports the local farmers and the local economy. Okay. Um, and uh, let's see, what was one of the others? Increasing community gardens. Oh, okay. The number of community gardens. Um, fostering uh, food-related businesses and I mean, I'm just picking them randomly. Food-related businesses, like little restaurants or vendors or processors? Even or? processors. Uh -huh. Like the whole food system, that's, that's what we're looking at. So everything from um, how we grow our food, how we produce it, how we process it, how we consume it, how okay. it's sold and distributed. With the aim to have what? Have it have more coming from your local area? That's only just one aspect? Or just more accessible to everyone that's in your community? I mean, trying to get... Both. Okay more accessible, and so that, I mean, the, the definition of food security okay. is um, to not be afraid, fear, be in fear of hunger, mm -hmm. or that you're going to starve. Okay. And the idea that you should, people should always have access to nutritious, high quality, culturally appropriate, safe, adequate amounts of food. That it's not going to be so expensive to be, that's not, that it becomes inaccessible. That it becomes inaccessible or they have to resort to emergency food systems mm -hmm. like the charity sector or mm -hmm. stealing or, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. okay. um, so that they, they have access to it and there's, there's dignity in that access as well. Nice word, dignity. Yeah. Okay. So, so that was so the fork report. So that was the Those access. Are some of the rec recommendations. Yeah, there. and and um, and we'll probably talk about how we are implementing some of those already. Um, the food charter is a really nice one. That it, that's kind of a starting place, because what a food charter does is it expresses the the city's commitment to a just and sustainable food system, and and it comes up with some principles and guidelines. Um, that allows the city to form a, uh, their whole food policy mandate and enhancing, you know, maybe existing policies within the government. And what I've liked about the process, because we have a draft ready to go to council this fall, so Wonderful. it's come a long ways. Okay. But again, there's been a lot of community input, and we actually held a public forum and invited the food community in to workshop the food charter. So again, it's Lots really about inviting people right. in and, and, and even a celebration of, of the food system too. I mean, you know, because we always have food at these events. I'm really events glad to hear that. And I mean, it's like if you're going to do food policy, for <laughs> yeah. heaven's sakes, at least eat and drink and, well, come on. and then you build community exactly. right? around food. Because, you know, say the word food policy and people are just going to go to sleep. Right. right. I, mean, I mean, even in our meetings, are, which we hold monthly and they're open to the public, um, we have some food there and there was a, in one of the meetings there was some um, it was called into question whether or not we should continue having the cheese and crackers and uh, occasionally the coordinator arranged for us to have cookies so we never quite knew but it was usually cheese because it's around dinner time and two camps formed there was the cheese camp and the cookie camp <laughs> And uh, the cookie camp is one out, so we have to make sure we eat before we go to our, to our meetings now. Well, the cookie's local. <laughs> the, cookies, the cookies are local and full of healthy okay. stuff, okay. so we're okay. Okay. Good passes. <laughs> yeah, so you can go on with it. Exactly. <laughs> so the charter. You're back so to the, the charter. So the charter. Yeah. So that is ready to go to be presented to council and this it, fall. Give us an idea of what is a, what is a food charter, just the flavor of that, so that other communities who might <sighs> think about doing that would know... What is that? Well, I can read you the first paragraph of the, cha uh, of the charter. We'll just give you an idea. 
Um, the Vancouver Food Charter presents a community vision for a just and sustainable food system. It provides principles and guidelines that describe the City of Vancouver's commitment to the sustainable food system to assist in the development of a coordinated municipal food policy and enhance existing policies and programs through the city organization. The Vancouver Food Charter animates our community's engagement and participation in conversations and actions related to food security. And some of the guided, guiding principles were that we looked at uh, community economic development, ecological health, social justice, collaboration, and participation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's a, it's so a brief it's a, document. And, and the principles are broad and would underlie things even if it's not related to food. It could be related to your, how you try and live in your whole city in many ways. Well, that's what, what we mean by enhancing existing mm -hmm. policies and mm -hmm. programs. Mm -hmm. so, so yes, it can add to. OK, to so we've got, we've got we were looking at food policy. We're looking at your assessment. Yes. You're looking at, I'm trying to remember the third and the fourth. We had, uh, the other one was a waste, waste management right. study. And right. again, we were looking at what are the opportunities, what are the barriers to recovering food waste, reusing mm -hmm. it, recycling it. And um, that report is now finished and it's being circulated throughout the city um, to like waste management departments and, okay. and other key representatives. So uh, that report was very interesting to me, even though I didn't work on it, but that's my background. Right. And right. I'll give you an example of, of one of the things. Um, you know, why don't more retailers compost? Thank you. I was going to wonder about that. So even though services exist, I mean, not everywhere, but certainly in Vancouver, um, so some of the barriers services exist to what to pick up they excess will pick up excess food waste okay from the from the clippings from the grocers right yes. or the the, the, or the, the restaurant. moldy food or the or the restaurants yeah. okay, the prep food yeah so some of the retailers think cost is prohibitive of, of employing a service that will pick up their compost that will actually pick it up i see a lot of them that were surveyed felt that they didn't really have enough to bother, to justify the cost. A small restaurant, we've only got a bucket or something. Yeah. It's not worth yeah. paying a lot. Okay. So, so okay. we discovered a lot of those sort of educational opportunities. Because if you really did an audit and collected that food waste for an entire week, you might find that there's more than you thought. Okay. You know, Or maybe there's cooperative opportunities where a group of Several retailers along together. one line, and we'll yeah. all just buy one service, yeah. and they'll just, buck, 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 you know, yeah. right? Okay. You know, so that kind of opportunity was okay. was really identified. Okay. Um, so that will help the city, um, you know, look at future programs around around waste management. Is there so what is just what's happening right now? Is there are services that will take those compostables and mm -hmm. what make? Uh, what they happens make, with them? They, they actually make fertilizer out of it, okay. natural fertilizer. And so we're looking at, are we, we're looking at for-profit businesses doing yes. this? Yes. Yeah. So you don't have like a, a non-profit that sort of does any of that kind of work per se? Not yet, but that was another identity, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, identified uh, opportunity, opportunity. Yeah. identified. Yeah. Um, all these opportunities for social enterprises. I would imagine there would be a lot of those. There really were. I mean, there's, there's a lot of gaps in that area. So what else, what else, um, there was a fourth. And then the fourth one was institutional food purchasing policy, which uh -huh. sounds very big. But um, what it ended up boiling down to, the city of Vancouver is very progressive. They, they really are, and they just have some dynamite people in the city right. who They're are fortunate. working on fabulous things. And they had already adopted an ethical purchasing policy. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. all of their purchases, they had to look at were they fairly produced, are they fairly distributed. Mm -hmm. Now we took it one step further and said let's create a sustainable food okay. purchasing policy. Okay. So we added our interests around food, let's, is it nutritious, uh, was it produced in an environmentally sound mm -hmm. manner? Is it local? Can it be locally sourced? Mm -hmm. um, was there fair treatment of animals? That kind okay. of thing. Okay. So what we've done now is we've come up with a policy brief, and 
we will be sh we're shopping that around at the moment mm -hmm. through the city mm -hmm. to the uh, purchasing department. So you say sustainable, mm -hmm. not necessarily organic, not necessarily, but probably moving in that direction. Definitely moving in that direction. I would, I would yeah. think so. Because yeah. that's going to be the more more sustainable. It is, like and that online. is one of our um, one of our goals. We actually have five goals, and and one of them is an, an environmental. Um, the first goal is actually quite lofty. It's uh, eradicate hunger in the city. Yes. I mean, that's a noble goal. <laughs> that should Head be. That, one. that was good. <laughs> exactly. And that's really important. But the, the environment is, is very important to us, too. And, and we do want to avoid the use of, of chemical fertilizers right. and pesticides. I would, I, would think so. I would think so. Yes. Now, one of the things that I notice as I come into Vancouver is, is here we are along a railroad track, and here are all these garden plots, mm. right? And it's like, and gardens everywhere. Yes. I think that you pride yourselves on having lots mm. of community gardens. Is that fair? There are a lot of community gardens. There, there are about 90 community gardens in total right now, um, but a total of 950 garden plots. Oh, okay. And uh, one of our city councillors early this spring put forward a motion to increase that number. I don't know if you know, but we're getting the Olympics here in mm -hmm. 2010. Okay. So as a legacy for 2010, we are going to try and increase our number of garden food producing garden okay. plots okay. to 2010 oh, garden plots. Oh, interesting. So by the year 2010, yeah. you will have... 2010, 2010 plots yes. of food producing, yes. which improves your food security. Exactly. Now, how does that work? I mean, where, where do people find the plots? And is this, does the Food Council help support or educate or whatever? Um, at the moment, we're still working out some of the infrastructure, but, but people can phone the food policy coordinator mm -hmm. or email the food policy coordinator. Um, and we do have avenues actually within the city that can assist them in, in finding a spot. I mean, some people will just do it in their backyard sure. or on a boulevard or you know, a rooftop or a balcony, something like that. Um, but if they want to be, because they will be counted as well, it's not just community gardens. Okay, so my rooftop garden works or my Your backyard garden counts. But it has right. to be new as of January 2006. Okay, all right, yeah. so that, that's fair. You gotta start off point. Yeah. And the, the acreage doesn't matter. It's just a no, plot. A plot, yes. And food producing. And it has to be food producing in some way. Yeah. Okay. So, but herbs and berries and sure. that kind of thing count too. Sure. Which, which I would imagine that that um, if if you, if people had like a, a lot that is not built on near them. Or, or, or other places that, that the property is owned by others, perhaps the city, perhaps not mm -hmm. the city. Mm -hmm. Are those of possibilities to, or do you, I mean, imagine you have to get permission to, to use land that you don't own. Yeah, I mean, you know, there are guerrilla gardeners in the city too, who have guerrilla simply, <laughs> who have simply, you know, started a garden on, on city land. Um, the city really is trying, they've, they've actually come up with some community garden guidelines mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And there's two groups in the city that are administering that, both the park board and the, um, the greenways department in the city. So, so there is some official help there to help you get public land. Um, but you know, there was a woman in town a few years ago who started a group called Neighbor Gardens. And it was so fantastic because it matched people up who wanted to garden with people okay. who didn't want to garden but, but, had, the land. but had the land. Okay. And, and she did that for several years and it was a huge success. But unfortunately, she up and moved back to Australia and, and no one else has picked up this great little idea. And I think that's a fabulous social enterprise idea too. I mean, you know, I think there's a way that people could pay a small... Uh, you know, like they do in the dating um, right, a little world, finder's right? Fee yeah, a little whatever. finder's fee. Right. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, matchmaker services right. only. It's just for your gardeners. That's right. 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 That's right. But I love that idea, and I think some people are doing it unofficially. We're beginning to do it in our community. We have Fantastic. our matchmaker is doing that. On yeah. it's a more rural community, but it's the same idea. Yeah. Fantastic. People who've got the land and the people who want, you know bring it together. Exactly. Fantastic. I can imagine that would you know that's a that's a model I think that every city. Every, every, every place 
could use. Yes. Because there's people who don't have the capability or the interest, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, but have the land that could be used. Exactly. And I was just visiting a friend on Vancouver Island and she gardens in her friend's backyard. And what she told me was they never, the family never used their backyard until she started gardening out there. And now they're coming out more because she's out there and sure, it becomes sure. a it's social, social. It's a very social. So you're building community. In, in and connections. they actually put in, ended up putting in a little pond and they've started to create other little garden areas themselves. So it, it's just fabulous how so that you, can catch So it's really on. social, but you're adding beauty and yeah. you're getting people connected back into the earth mm -hmm. and the water and sun and so on, which urban dwellers need, frankly. Exactly. And greening the environment. I mean, we know that that's important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if you're growing your own food, you're actually cutting down on packaging. Of course. That's right. So there's all sorts and you're of benefits. cutting down on all the petroleum use because it's you're exactly. not having to drive somewhere to go get it to pick yeah. the tomato off your vine and yeah. and so on. Yes. How are you um, doing any social enterprises yet with the composting? Since that's been an area that's mm -hmm. been a love of yours. Actually, that gives me two things: composting and education. Right. I think would be an important part of of facilitating people doing more urban gardening mm -hmm. is to learn how do I start and how do right. I food feed things and what do I plant and all kinds of other questions. The, the city has had a program in place for, for many years and I actually did work for the organization that, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. offered the composting program and we had a demonstration garden where people could come and learn about composting, take organic gardening courses. So there's a lot of that in place in the city. There's really people can find out whatever they need to And my hear. memory was that even on the Vancouver Food Policy site there are links to some classes. On the website there's very good information. There's a, a calendar of community events, there's publications, there's the, the classes and workshops are posted. So that exactly. you know it's easy to find those things. Yes. Um, food security. Mm -hmm. You mentioned food security mm -hmm. and I'm reminded of Francis Moore Lopez's book, Hope's Edge, in which he talks about the city of Porto Alegre in uh, Brazil, mm -hmm. that considered it a, a right for every person to have nutritious food and actually built several cafes where people can get a, an inexpensive meal that's healthy, locally right. grown or food and so on. I remember thinking, what an idea yes. to consider that a right that people have to have one, you know, and, and help provide them with one nutritious meal a day. Mm -hmm as well as helping to have local farmers be able to be able to sell their produce. So I'm wondering if any of those are ideas that have filtered yet into Vancouver, whether one of the barriers that I know for local farmers can be the middle person, the middleman, mm -hmm. pricing, any ways to help your local growers mm -hmm. get their food to the people. I don't, has that showed up anywhere? Well, uh, there are many farmers markets uh -huh. in, in Vancouver. There's a real system of farmers markets. Okay. Um, yes, I, I know about that, and uh, Bella Horizonte, I think, was there was another example that I thought was fantastic, where the city actually made um, downtown land available to retailers, mm -hmm. food re retailers, mm -hmm. so that they would, and so they would give them the the land really, really cheap, so they could have their stores there. Yes. But then they, the retailers had to agree to sell the produce at a flat rate. Okay. So they were these low-cost stores. And the retailers did okay because they could, they could buy in bulk or, you know, and, and it worked out for them. And then it, and anyone could shop there. You know, you didn't have to be a low-income person. Anyone could, could shop, shop there. Okay. Yeah. So there was a lot of volume coming through as well. But it made it accessible to all. And I love that idea. And there is actually one um, uh, low-cost store down on the downtown east side that um, has been it's operating. that way. Yes. Because I can, but you see, in that example that you give, it's, it's, a, it's a support that the government can give mm -hmm. in some particular form to, to retail exactly. and, and to the farmers. Exactly. We have a bare two minutes left, and I wanted to ask you about, there's a conference coming up in the fall. Yes that you're, you're sponsoring. So just give us a word about that. Okay. It's um, the Community Food Security Coalition out of the U.S. and Food Secure Canada. And, oh, 
I'll read you the title here. It's Bridging Borders Toward Food Security. So mm -hmm. it's in the fall. But it's just a wonderful um, excuse for the food communities to come together and talk about food um, in all its aspects. And there will be workshops and, of course, um, uh, training sessions and field trips mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and quite a lot of eating. I imagine, <laughs> yes, quite a lot of eating. Of mostly Vancouver locally grown food, right? Yes. You're going to have to follow your yes. principles if this no, is local. No, absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, one of the dinners is a celebration of, of BC foods. So. And I think you are in a wonderful place for that. I mean, one of the things I notice as a Californian is all the berries mm -hmm. in this season. That this is, a, this is an abundant and fertile region. Yes, it is. So you have, you have that going for you in terms mm -hmm. of meeting your goals for, for food security for it's your true. people. It's true. You're very blessed that way. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you for joining me thank you. And, and letting us know what is being thought about in sort of broader and bigger terms in, mm -hmm. in an urban area. I hope that mm -hmm. food policy councils show up everywhere I hope as so we too. move into the future. I hope so too. Thank you. Thank you. You're watching Peak Moment, Community Responses for a Changing Energy Future. I'm Jenea Donaldson. Thanks for joining me.